Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'd like to um, just to say that uh, we have a slight technical problem, uh, and uh, we apologise for the delay. Uh, so what that will do is that we'll put more pressure on our guests to communicate architecture because we cannot uh, use the images, which is interesting. So we are now going by uh, another format. And uh, I think that's interesting because uh, hopefully everybody in the audience has had at least a taste of the Biennale. And from this morning, when President uh, Barata received the uh, honorary um, document from the, uh, the Royal Institute of the Architects of Ireland, uh, he spoke very passionately uh, about the value of architecture and the legacy of the, the Biennale. And it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody here now. And I'll just introduce um, our uh, guests. On my far left is Kieran Long, then Pia Lonin, and David Smith. And the format was to be that each of uh, the guests would have a five or ten minute presentation to you to explain themselves. But because there are gremlins in the system, uh, we are now on another format. So I think it's a very interesting challenge to the guests. Uh, I would like to say that um, when we began with uh, uh, free space as a theme and uh, the, the participants, there are different kinds of participants. Both Kieran and uh, Ia uh, are, um, in, in, if you like, expressing architecture in one way, and David was, uh, came on board in terms of the uh, graphic representation. So, uh, I might switch things a little bit now, if, if our guests don't, we had another format in mind. But I might begin with uh, a, a question. When Shelley and I were approached to, to be part of the Biennale, as I said to Group 1 today, we had to um, uh, develop a manifesto, which we called Free Space. And what was interesting then is that we had to uh, what was interesting for us was that free space was, a, as I said, like a shish kebab. It was free and space put together as a new word with a new meaning. And then when we began the uh, graphic identity, we had to find people with whom to work where that kind of concept was uh, discussed, first of all, and that we'd have some communication uh, and understanding of each other. And out of that was born uh, this, which is the, um, uh, the, the, if you like, the free space. So maybe my first question to a non-architect, who's very lucky to be on this stage, by the way. Uh, so a non-architect over here, actually you should probably sit further away, and ask you what it was like to begin a discussion with architects who had a new word and uh, an exhibition of architecture that was going to be on a world stage, and we asked you to be involved. Thank you, Shelley. Um, or Yvonne, excuse me. <laughs> I'm walking out. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's all right, that, That's the icebreaker. Um, look, I think the first thing was obviously it was, it was a huge honor, um, and it was it was quite overwhelming when you think about the scale of the project and the task that the office had taken on. Um, for us also, it was the first time that we'd ever worked with architects. Um, so everything was new. Um, we're primarily editorial designers, so we, we understood what was involved in producing the catalog and, and so forth. But the scale of the project and trying to meet, I suppose, all of the conceptual cues that um, Shelley and Yvonne had uh, hinted at in the manifesto was, was quite difficult. Um, however, um, from my perspective, um, the key thing was I felt that it was my responsibility not to communicate for architects. Um, and I had to work in a means that I, uh, my audience was greater than the architectural community. Um, and that audience included Venice. As, as the commissioner and the supporter, um, but also the visitors and the people of Venice, and then there was a global audience. So this was something 
in the in the back of my head um, consistently that I had to uh, refer to when we were having conversations where architecture was prioritised over communication. Um, and we just spoke about it briefly earlier, but the biggest difficulty for me was that there was no common language, despite us both being designers, and um, despite us using common phrases, common terms, and having you know an understanding of a vocabulary of design, um, we, we didn't actually speak the same language. Uh, our priorities were very, very different uh, as designers. Um, what we privileged over one thing or another was very, very different. What we sought to communicate as designers using the same vocabulary was also very, very different. So there was a, a significant learning curve for, for myself and my colleagues in the studio to get to have um, a common ground where we could begin to communicate. And once we had that common ground, it became easier to, I suppose, deal with the nuances in the, the Free Space Manifesto. Um, I'd like to ask Pia now, because Pia is Finnish, and Finnish is one of the um, strangest languages in the world. Um, and uh, the, uh, we had a very interesting conversation at lunch uh, just about the edges of language. So maybe in terms of what Finnish translation of free space is, and was there a discussion in, among Finnish architects or in terms of whether it's an accurate interpretation of the concept of free space in terms of language? Mm. Well, there was no discussion. It was a discussion in my own head. <clears throat> and uh, for me, it was really <clears throat> obvious that free space is uh, what I am as an architect doing, in fact, because architecture for me is like um, making frames for life. So I see architecture as making frames, you know, and so frames are free spaces for life to happen <laughs> somehow. So for me, it was a really nice word. In Finnish, it's called vapa tila. Vapa tila. Yeah, vapa tila. Great. <laughs> but you need two words in Finnish to make to make free space. But yeah, free space. Yeah. <clears throat> but I, I was uh, discussing with you about language that in in Finland we only use few words to express ourselves because we go straight to the point. So maybe um, we don't need two hours to explain something, we need only two minutes. So <clears throat> I would love to give my presentation if it, it's going to happen, because I only use a few words. But um, yeah, so I, I went straight to the point, free space, that was really obvious. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to use a lot of words for that. It was really good. and and. Um, for me, it was really good word. I'm doing it all the time, so, yeah. Hmm? Okay. Uh, I, I find it interesting that Kieran uh, has moved to live in uh, Sweden, and there was a conversation uh, about um, what is it like to move into another language. We're now talking about verbal language and communication uh, even before and beyond architecture. Maybe you'd like to say a few words, Kiran, just about translating. I, I mean, a few words about words. Uh, yeah, I've recently moved to Stockholm to be the director of ArcDES, the Muse National Museum of Architecture and Design, and I'm learning Swedish, and that's all um, interesting. But I think one of, the, one of the things you really learn, I don't know, Yvonne, if you had this experience by making exhibitions, is that critics, and perhaps some people like you, like people in this culture who care about our field and read about it and read the magazines, they care a lot about words. But my experience of the public in exhibitions is that they care about the things. And that's quite a big difference. You always find when you open an exhibition, there's a bunch of people who want to come and read the story. They want to understand the Free Space Manifesto, probably, all of those people. But the rest of the exhibition is played out by people really reacting with their bodies and their senses to whatever the objects are in the room. And when we 
tackled the Free Space Manifesto, it was both of those things in mind. It was, of course, trying to bring the work of Sigurd Leverance into focus, but also to create a kind of bodily experience. And I think that attitude, like exhibitions happen to the body and not to the brain, is my view. That's helped me get over a kind of, obviously, a cultural dislocation that involves me, you know, from me being a British director of a Swedish national museum. We just made a big exhibition there about the Swedish public realm and all sorts of debates and very detailed things to do with debates around design and architecture in the public realm. But because we decided that all of the people in the show should create something that, as I say, happens to your body, the kind of linguistic differences have been suppressed and our common experiences are promoted. And maybe that's something that architecture does as well as exhibitions. Um, just see if this, does this one work? It? Yes, it does. I think before we follow on that theme with Kieran about the exhibition, I'd just like to stay for a little longer on the written and the spoken word. Um, uh, how we, there's a beautiful play by uh, Brian Friel, the Irish playwright, called Translations. And in that uh, play, it's uh, uh, surveyors, British surveyors who come to a part of Ireland to map the land and to record it. And because they don't speak Irish, don't speak Gaelic, they record it phonetically. So the, the names of the fields and the names of the land, which had a history embedded in a language, is then translated into a, a tonal situation. So meaning is lost. And what's very touching about that play is that words carry meanings and carry histories and carry uh, experiences. So when we uh, speak to uh, other disciplines, when we speak to clients, when we speak to the public. Um, you might accuse our profession as having a kind of a secret language. And I think that we need to discuss how uh, architects, are you viewing architects, David, that, that when you said earlier on that, that we, we share certain words, but conceptually they're probably completely different. And that's an interesting thing, that maybe we're, what's that phrase about between Europe and uh, American ease or English American, that we're divided by a common language. That sometimes we keep having to go back to language to try and explain ourselves. In, you're saying in Finland you go straight to the point, in other languages it's round and round about and you have to try and find what really people are saying. But that's what's very interesting, I suppose, about human beings, that we that we try and share experiences and we try and uh, find uh, connection. But before, before we go into the exhibition uh, as, a, as a theme, I'd like to just hold on on words for a moment. Maybe you have some comments, David. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, communication designers and graphic designers also have a jargon and peer-to-peer -peer communication can also be abstract and impenetrable. Um, and I think this always comes back to audience. Who do you wish to speak to? And I think the language that we use should be tailored specifically to who we want to speak to. And to be Finnish in, in Outlook, it should, you should use the least number of words possible to get the message across as quickly as possible. And as a communication designer, I would always prioritize the end user. And in the context of the Biennale, despite a significant proportion of the audience being architects, and being able to interpret the language that you would use amongst your peers, I was always thinking of the public and how we speak and communicate. I suppose abstract concepts, kind of the intellectual inquiry associated with the Free Space Manifesto and how, how it would be understood, but never with an expectation that they would understand everything. And that's also very, very important because it's not possible. I think it becomes too labored and too complex if you, if you expect everybody to understand every priority that you've established as a designer. So in looking at free space and the way we just asked for each of the participants to translate free space, it was, it was the quickest way for uh, those nationalities to, be, to belong to feel that there was an, a part of them. Uh, I said at, uh, earlier at lunch, there was no, there's no political colors, there's no flag. It's just that word that resonates with them because they understand the language and they understand the meaning. And we don't have to go any further into the depths of the manifesto. They can then spend more time if they feel engaged. So just by trying to take a single word or, an, or a translation of free space, that was the, the first connection. And once that connection is made, 
you can spend as much as you, as much time as you wish to have a deeper understanding. But it, it's almost like a hello. It's like it's, it's that exchange, reaching your hand out to to other communities and other participants. So. So language in, in, and again, as a communication designer, and pr primarily as a typographer, you know, all, all of my work is, is off text, you know, it, it's textual and it is about how we interpret that text. But it, it, like any piece of text, you can skim it and have a very superficial understanding, or you can read deeper and read more and read broader and deeper and, and have a, a, a greater sense of understanding of something very, very complex. But the very, very first word or the very first gesture has to be very simple and open and, and, and accessible. So that is the thinking that informed, I suppose, us advocating for a textual approach, advocating for language over image. Um, because I think image is, is easy. I think image is very easy, um, particularly for architecture, given the quality of the, the visual record of, of, of buildings and environment. But it's always open to interpretation and it's more often than not, the the common person's interpretation is not the one that you wish. So, yeah. it's about simplification. It's interesting. It's interesting when David is speaking. I'm reminded, and I'm sure our team uh, remembers as well. In the very beginning, one of the photographs we took in the the um, uh, Doge's Palace, which was an extraordinary photograph for us, which was uh, the light reflected on the floor and another kind of light, which was uh, sunlight. So we had, it's in the catalog actually as a photograph, uh, where for the first time I had never seen it before, where sky factor and sunlight were separated. And it was a really a beautiful and strong image. And we, for, a, for a while we toyed about an image trying to represent this kind of free space uh, idea, because it was about light and the sun and the reaction of space to light. But in the end, it's interesting what you're saying, that image, if we had chosen a building or a place or a brick column, it would have been too specific for the conceptualization of what you have called Pia, like that's what you do all the time, you try and find the free space. But I do think that's an interesting thing that through dialogue with you, we went away from the single image as representing the whole of the Biennale because the Biennale is so big and has such a big, uh, possibility that maybe putting something that's uh, interpreted differently gave us a uh, possibility of, uh, to use a French word, nuance and change and different identity. Maybe you'd like to speak, um, Kieran, about... Yeah, I mean, it makes me think. It makes me think of one thing. I, I worked with David Chipperfield on the Venice Biennale in 2012. Um, and those of you who came may remember the first room, the title of that was Common Ground, which we've always felt had a lot of resonances with, with the, free, the Free Space Manifesto was in some ways more ambitious than, than a common, a, a kind of fairly banal phrase like Common Ground. But in the first room of the Biennale, we put a well, a pozzo well, one, a typical Venetian well, which we found in a salvage, architectural salvage place here in Venice. And that became our symbol. So we didn't, we didn't want an abstraction. We wanted something highly specific, but that could stand for the whole idea of how architecture and a public space can be both infrastructure and social life at the same time. Can, you know, it's, it's one of a type of thing, the Pozzo well, that, is, that defines a city quarter, it defines an identity, it defines a public space. It is itself a beautiful object. So in a way, we did kind of the opposite, as I sometimes feel, and both, both are possible. We, we hopefully transfigured this well into a more general symbol, which we felt could stand for at least the participants in the Biennale. But of course, that well doesn't have universal meaning in the whole world, but, it, but at least here in Venice, standing here in Venice, we felt that was a powerful symbol. Yeah, I was thinking of um, telling stories, because, you know, I'm heavily practicing architect, um, and doing housing uh, and, and public buildings. So I'm doing buildings, really. And um, I think that uh, making architecture is, is like uh, making a script writing. Or, yeah, in, in, you have, uh, in the script you have many phases like you have in, in architectural practice also. And at the end there is a house, there is a building which stands still and quiet there 
and by its own existence it, it somehow takes part into shaping society, but maybe there is an um, interesting story behind to be told, to be, which must be told. I mean, um, and um, then I go back, when I communicate uh, architecture, when, I com when I, I'm going, coming here to tell about this building, I go back to my script somehow, <clears throat> to find out how, I, how I'm going to tell you the story. So here I have, and I, I guess many architects have this connection for uh, play, play writing or screenwriting, how do you call it, script write, writing. And it's, it's all about telling stories. I think I have been telling stories for the last uh, 30 years because, yeah, but maybe we go deeper into the exhibition later. But, um, yeah, it's about language. You say, the, uh, you describe architecture as the silent language that speaks, that architecture as a phenomenon. Yeah. When you stand in front of a building, yeah. it tells you of its past, it's participating yeah. now and it will last in the future. That yeah. it's an amazing communicator. Some buildings frighten you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some buildings For good are, or bad. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah, I, I know that uh, Rem Kolhas, I, I think it's Kolhas, uh, who, who is talking about screenwriting and scripts, and I don't know exactly what he means, but, but for, for me it's a very deep understanding that I'm somehow all the time uh, <clears throat> writing something <laughs> and wanting, I'm wanting to influence on uh, society by shaping it with my buildings, that's very ambitious uh, way to say, but that's my aim, yeah, for good. When we were writing the manifesto, we, we referred to a, a beautiful piece by Jorn Utzen, which is the threshold doorway of his house, Can Lease, mm -hmm. in Mallorca. Yeah. And what's amazing about that seat is that it's concrete and tile, very hard materials, mm -hmm. But the word that it says in architecture is welcome and greeting and sit. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting, I suppose, is that as architects, that we're trying to communicate built form and spaces so that somebody understands. It's a very, it's when people talk about architectural language, it'd be interesting to hear from a non-architect, when, when you hear us talk about architectural language, we're in the end talking about built buildings, that buildings can say things. Like the Arsenale says, I'm an Arsenale, walk down the Cordery and my columns are every six meters and I make ships and don't forget that. It's a building that speaks. But as an architect, when we talk about communicating architecture, and well, we'll go into the exhibition in a minute, but just architecture to you maybe, David. Again, it comes back to, I think you, well, the, the brief experience that I've had working and, and the initial view, um, and I suppose, since I, I've been more aware of, of how architects are, are, are communicating, I think they're privileging their peers more often, that they are, they're speaking to each other too, too much, and that would be my view. And that's, that's not a, a fault, that's just, a, it's just a, that's what you're used to. And that actually, it's very easy, I think, to, to pivot by, by changing language, some, some language, like any, any technical jargon, it, it's, it's for a very specific audience. But I felt as our conversations went on that we could tease out, you know, a common vocabulary and we could share um, similar views and sentiments around what you were trying to express. But when we started speaking very early on in the process, uh, I know it was frustrating for Emmett and, and frustrating for you when, when I was saying things or my colleagues were saying things and, and they just were not the same. And, um, but I think the, the sentiment is the same and even one of the things that I found working with you in the project is even though you're speaking of the, of the built form, the actual, the spirit of what you're trying to communicate is actually universal. And I think it, it, the, I suppose the, the tactic or, or not the tactic, the priority for us was to make sure that the spirit of what architects are trying to communicate needs to come forward and not be always directly associated with the built form that that actually the communication designer if they spend time with the architect and they listen and they begin to understand the nuances that the essence and the spirit of what what is your intention 
beyond the building actually is manifest. And I think that is something that's very, very important because that is when architecture or any, any art form or design becomes open and available to everybody and not elite or specialist. And, and I think any, anything, any art form should be opened up to the broadest possible public for them to appreciate. So, so I think it took us a lot of listening to, to, to know that even though you were speaking of, of, of buildings, speaking of their purpose and their value, that actually when you take the building out of the conversation, there is, there is real intention and value f for the public and for more. Um, and it's not always, it doesn't always have to be measured in the actual physical building. Um, Can I ask you, it's just very interesting, when you're speaking, one of the things I think it's true to say, and maybe all the panel can comment on it, is that uh, the, the visual that is so important now. We all have iPhones and the internet, that architecture is kind of, dun, 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 you know, that, and uh, architecture is seen as being uh, eye-catching and eye-candy. And that's really what you're saying, or what we could discuss, or maybe the audience also ha have views, is that um, the, the problem is that it becomes architecture as a kind of visual intensity, so that um, uh, the eye, I mean, I'm quoting from uh, the, the Finnish uh, writer, um, Johan Palasma, uh, who speaks, uh, which we are indebted to in terms of the way he talks about claiming back the kind of physicality of uh, architecture. So what I'm interested in, maybe just for a little bit longer, I know we're now technical hitches are now hopefully uh, solved, um, that that words and discussions of concepts can keep th can are, are needed to be enjoyed or fleshed out, and not only the visual, because architecture is not just a visual phenomenon. And yet, in the press and in the magazines and in the kind of internet, it's the z it's the incredibly fast visualization um, of uh, of architecture. It kind of strips it back of its deep story that you refer to, uh, Pia, and what you're talking about, depths of meaning. Do you think that's true, though, Yvonne? I, I find the contemporary discourse of architecture more focused on the context than ever before, more precisely focused on the breadth of potential experience, on s matters of sociology, of matters of politics. There's never been more focus, and, and the two biennales that precede yours take as their context radically different starting points from the architectural object, you would say. So I struggle to agree with that, even though we have the internet, and yes, the internet is image-driven. I think the, the profession, or at least the context for the profession, the, the discourse around the profession has never been more focused on, on the breadth of potential impacts, almost to a fault. I mean, I should also say, I'm also not an architect, by the way, so, so we're equal yeah. architects and non-architects, um, and, and I never have been. Um, but. Uh, what, what I find interesting about your Biennale and, and your approach is to bring, bring back, or, or to remind us, I think, of the, of the horizon within which it's possible for architecture to act, which is in the main at the scale of a building or group of buildings. And you see that a lot, that kind of scale here in the Biennale. There are very few projects, there are a few, but there are very few projects at the scale of a whole city or a whole country. There are lots of projects at the scale of, of an individual building. Um, and I think that's the strength of your Biennale, but I can't find, I can't recognize the, p the picture you're painting of an obsession with architectural image outside of banal websites. I mean, the, our profession is really, I think, probably people here are more concerned, and young architects I find are more concerned with the social context for their work than in any time since I've been writing about this field. Yeah. Should I show my pictures? Okay, but I, I already used my few words, you know. <laughs> Should I repeat them? <laughs> she, she, she leaves Finland and there's a quota on the number of words that she can use. <laughs> yeah, but uh, as I said, uh, for me, uh, making architecture is like uh, making a script. So, uh, <clears throat> at the end there is this building, this building, um, which, which by its own existence takes part in the shaping society, hopefully. But it's quiet, as I said. So it needs to be, there's a story to be told. And uh, as I said, I go back then to the script, 
to my actual work as an architect. So in this case, uh, I had four chapters. And I, I went back to these chapters to think uh, how I, I'm going to make this exhibition for the Biennale. And I, I will show them to you now. First of all, there is chapter one, which is a kind of political act. It's very political because there's many act there are many actors and the architect takes uh, a role of an activist, kind of asking silly questions uh, and getting a, a lot of uh, resistance and, and also backup from the city and at the end it's, it's going to happen. So it's a, a successful story, a hard story, but very political. So after that chapter, we are ready to to, uh, to concentrate on, on what architects usually, usually do, designing house. So here uh, I designed the framework building <coughs> for my house. And the developer builds the house and sells the apartments. And after that, the architect, at this case, leaves the uh, skin. How do you say skin? Scene, leaves the scene. So, uh, chapter three, the residents take over. They set up their own projects. Architect is not there anymore. So that's the storyline. <clears throat> chapter four, uh, the residents make their homes. So I have here these four uh, chapters. How should I present them here in Biennale? Um, it ended up like this. <clears throat> so here you might see that I have almost all the chapters in that, that one um, scene. There is this chapter two with the framework building, my design, and then you can feel the, the scale of this framework building, which is very important for me because I did a lot of work to achieve these uh, dimensions which are ideal for do-it-yourself building. And at the end there is this uh, um, monitor with a film telling about um, homes, people's homes, their own stories. So I kind of um, wanted to show uh, all these chapters I have on my script to you. What I left uh, was chapter one, which was this political act of me, because that was um, really hard somehow to bring to this exhibition. Maybe, maybe I need a book or something for that, but that, that I left <laughs> home. So I have the other chapters here, um, and, and I hope that people can somehow see the process of of uh, making architecture in this project here. Well, this is something which I really like because um, I put all the architectural drawings and sections here for the professionals. But, I <laughs> but there, this little girl is so enthusiastic about these plans and sections and taking pictures of that. That's fantastic. I, I think that's, well, wordless. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, that's how I ended up somehow trying to tell my story here without words, but physically. What, yeah. what I find uh, terrifically clear about the way you have described the phenomenon that was real in Helsinki. Yeah. And that then you had these chapters. Yeah. And that when we bring people around, you're able to say to somebody who's not an architect, this is the actual size of yeah. what the architect has made. These are the stories of people who now live there yeah. and can change it. And uh, we, we um, there are a lot of Irish people in the audience, and our Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, came to visit the Biennale. And we thought... Uh, there were a, a number of really important things that he would see because we have a housing crisis in, uh. Uh, in Ireland. 
and we brought him to see this. And he was really fascinated by looking at the plans. And I mentioned to you at lunch that he particularly uh, is not a fan of open plan, but wanted the possibility of rooms, which can still happen in your matrix, in your framework yeah. for life. Yeah. So we also find that your presentation is a very useful, it's not just a lovely yeah. thing in itself, yeah. but communicating architecture, which is this afternoon's topic, that yeah. you have made something which is very useful, very beautiful, and you're trying to communicate it to others so yeah. that they can join in the fourth and fifth chapter yeah. of your work. Yeah, yeah. in the first place, I was uh, going to make an installation out of the concept. But then I started to discuss with you, and uh, you may, well, um, it was really good that you encouraged me to show the real building, to show the story and, and so, instead of making fantastic um, installation which people can take uh, beautiful pictures and put to Instagram, you know, or I can publish to architectural magazines, you know. So I, I really wanted, as you also encouraged me to do, is to show the actual project. I think that that's something that we in our team really discussed yeah. deeply. That uh, and uh, President Barata referred to it this morning at the uh, ORI uh, ceremony. That architecture is not the art biennale. Mm. That the art biennale, they bring the beautiful painting, they yeah. bring the beautiful piece of sculpture, but architecture is different. Yeah. So how do we communicate architecture? And yeah. what I must say about this, it gives you dimension and scale mm. and reality and dream. That, mm. that, is, that is useful, that architecture is an art that is useful. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not uh, only making nice shapes something else to yeah to go straight <laughs> to the point yeah yeah okay Maybe we, if, if the technology um, I don't know we'll see thank you Pia that's the end of that slide mm -hmm. we live it may not happen is it it works okay but it is it is the interesting thing maybe you could just comment yeah. on it how you know architecture is not it's not art, and it's not something else, it's architecture. Yeah, and I think architecture needs to be less anxious about not being art. It needs to be less worried about what it isn't and focus on what it is, because uh, I feel like there's this collective anxiety around architecture that it's somehow difficult for the public to understand or it's somehow the artifacts of architecture are too complex. I mean, my museum in Stockholm sits next to one of the great modern art collections in Europe, a fantastic collection of modern art. All of the abstraction in there, all of the pop art in there, all of the things that are in there are just as difficult to understand as an architectural drawing. But what art museums do is they merely show the object, beautifully lit, beautifully presented, beautifully mounted. There's a complete lack of interpretation in most art museums compared to most design and architecture museums or, or exhibitions. And I think we should learn something from that. Because when you encounter a painting, as I said, it happens to you it happens to your senses. You may know a lot about it or you may not, but it happens to your senses. And too often in architecture and design, we don't let that happen. So what I was going to, in my little brief presentation, I was going to sort of just offer two sort of lessons, which, which I've learned very much through my work. So I just quickly whip through this. Um, there are two things um, I wanted to say about how to communicate architecture. And this is, I'm, I'm an exhibitions person, I'm an institutional person, I work in a museum, so it's sort of, forgive me that. Number one, gather the evidence. One thing I really learned from architect, from being in museums, is you have to get real things and put them in a room. Because what is an exhibition, if not a, merely a regime of attention? It's a room you walk into where you, where you have a particular kind of attention on things. And this was that, this was that, um, that well that I mentioned before. We, there are wells like this all over, all over Venice. In every major public space in Venice, there's one of these wells, and they were historically the place where people gathered their fresh water, and of course, therefore, they became a meeting place and a place that signified publicness, not in an institutional way, in an informal infrastructural way. And so 
taking that found object, that real object that once did stand in, in the middle of a Venetian public square, I think was powerful. There was no label, there was no film, there was nothing else, just the well. And if you'd been walking around Venice, as we all have been the last couple of days, you see these out there. And to, but to put it in the Biennale is a different thing. It makes you think about it more carefully and differently. And when I worked at the Victoria and Albert Museum, we did this with some very strange objects. So this is not an architectural object, but it's an object of design. It's a MacBook Air. Um, but this MacBook Air was owned by the Guardian newspaper and used to store the files that Edward Snowden leaked from the NSA to the Guardian. And the British Secret Services destroyed this computer in the basement of the Guardian newspaper. So extremely violent and powerful act of altering a work of design. I mean, the v &A has lots of Apple computers in its collection. And this is just an extremely interesting Apple computer. But we think encountering this introduces you to the violence and the, the extremes of the debate around the digital public realm. As does an object like this, another thing I collected for the V&A. This is a wearable computer. If you've ever bought anything from Amazon, then the person who fulfilled your order is probably wearing something like this. But this kind of infrastructure and design object is totally invisible to most of us, but is defining working lives for hundreds of thousands of people in Europe and tens of thousands in the UK. And this is another example of a digital object. This is a 3D printed gun, a functioning 3D printed firearm, which we collected for the V&A. Extremely controversial object, an extremely difficult object, but one that changes fundamentally our relationship as citizens in public um, as a work of design. Standing next to the real thing, knowing that can fire a bullet is a powerful experience. And when we made the Biennale in 2012, um, we, did, we brought some of this sensibility there. This is an exhibition we made in a room just a couple of, couple of doors away of Rafael Maneo's drawings. We put his original drawings of a series of um, works that he made in, in Madrid um, all along one street. Um, very, very powerful to see these real, you know, they span his whole career, 45 years of, of architecture from the beginning to the end. They span one street. There's a very elegant text about what it means to be an architect who works in just one city. But something about these being the evidence of a life lived through a city and through architecture was powerful. Um, and maybe I'll skip this one because I don't have time to, to, to go into it. The second thing, become the territory you are defending. So uh, this is sort of... So we talk about the objects as evidence. The things in an exhibition are like evidence. But what is the ground you're walking on exactly? What kind of public space is it? What kind of public space is the corderia? What kind of public space is a museum? And I, I stole this sentence from a very brilliant essay in the French Pavilion, which you should all see. It was a fantastic exhibition. Um, there's an essay by a journalist called Jade Lindgard, where she says, become the territory you are defending, i.e. make your space into the space you're defending. Don't make an image of the thing you're trying to talk about. Make it the thing you're trying to talk about. We made an exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum called All of This Belongs to You, which was kind of in that spirit, all about talking about what is this collection? Who owns it? Who, whose is it exactly? What rights do you have over it? It is the nation's commonwealth somehow. Like, we all own it, but you can't take it home. So what does it therefore mean? Where is it taken from? And we had this proposal, which is the most literal one we made, but unfortunately didn't happen, to put a polling station in the Raphael Gallery at the v &A during the general election in um, 2014, I think. This never happened, unfortunately, but, but this image became extremely powerful for us, precisely to say, don't talk about public space, be a public space. Um, we did things like putting anti-homeless spikes in the, in the lobby of the v &A. And this is a project from the 2012 Biennale where in the Arsenale we made a Venezuelan street food restaurant from a barrio in, in Caracas um, in the middle. This won the, won the um, Golden Lion in our exhibition. Um, and we had, and whenever, if, if you take this logic seriously, if you say, become the territory you are defending, you end up having fights with people. And we had a big fight with the Biennale about this because they didn't want us to sell food, of course, because they have their own restaurant. Um, but we had Venezuelans who came from Venezuela to sell their arepas. They were better than the food you could get then. They have a nicer restaurant now. Um, but this was a big fight. And the job of the work of institutional people is to win that argument. Not to create the work, it's just to win, create the conditions where you can be that kind of public space. And in a much more historically oriented way, our project we made for, for your Biennale, Yvonne, is, is trying to both show the evidence and be the space somehow at the same time. There are extremely accurate and high quality reproductions of real drawings from our collection of Sigurd Leverance's work in Stockholm. But there are also these amazing um, models made by Petra Gipp, the Swedish architect. She designed them. 
ambiguous in scale, but scaled to your body and scaled to the room, not scaled to the building. So you have a kind of spatial relationship with them, which is not didactic, but is about your body. Um, and from, from this angle, they're kind of like drawings. And, and as you go around them, they become more like spaces. And then what you see through them are Mikael Olsson's extraordinary new photography of the spaces as they are today. So there's a relationship between the models and the drawings and the photographs, which is, as I say, you can learn a lot from it, but there are almost no words in this exhibition, and that's something we're quite proud of. So that's it, really. I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, what I'd like to say about uh, listening to you speak, uh, Kieran, is the when you talk about uh, evidence and the space in, uh, in your uh, um, uh, presentation here, what also happens is that uh, there are three buildings by the same architect in different periods of his life um, that you, uh, you, you bring us back through uh, contemporary evidence, if you like, right through to the drawings, to the, photog to the photography, to uh, other images. And it's, a, it's like a a shish kebab of time, you bring us now back to then. And it's very, it's very beautiful to stand in a room and be reminded. And I think also in terms of the text, that the, that the catalogue and the, the, the actual... Uh, I found on Thursday night, I was uh, going through the catalogue again and looking at the, the images that you have. And the, 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 I don't have the big book here in front of me. But when you look at the... The book is after the exhibition. It survives. I mean, you're talking about the story, Pia. That, that the, the, there's the exhibition, there's the content, and then there's the book. So there's another legacy that you can imagine in many years to come that you can flick open the page and be reminded of both your uh, um, uh, pieces. And when you were speaking, it also reminds me that in uh, the close encounter section that people will visit tomorrow in the, in the, in the Giardini, uh, which was uh, co-curated with Professor Hugh Campbell, what is interesting as we were discussing that, we didn't put, of the 16 pieces made by other architects of other architects' work, we didn't put the names and information on the things. So that it meant that people would go around not knowing and scratching their heads and say, I like that, what is it? Or, and it was a curatorial decision to put some of the information a little bit away. So first of all, you either engaged with something or not, and that's what's interesting, say, in Pia, in yours, that you're in a space, you, stu you ha can listen to information, and then you can go to the drawings if you want to. But it's interesting how, when you talk about evidence, you're saying about evidence and space uh, to stand in the space. So there's evidence from the past in yours, and then you are actually claiming that room with the three yeah. enormous... I was just to add one thing. I think what, what we're circling around is how much do you trust the visitor? How much do you trust the public to make the connections in their own imagination? And how free can you let them be? Because I think design museums in particular have this mania of advocating for design, of saying, if you're going to talk about design, you must tell people how important it is. I mean, art museums don't feel that at all. They don't feel any anxiety to say, look, you must come here and learn how important art is. They just say, art is important. What's important is how your imagination reacts to this object. And what we try to make in our space is an opportunity, an invitation for people to make a, a series of connections between three different kinds of work, the drawings, the photographs, and the models, that is absolutely for them to make. You know, they may not understand that those are three buildings from three different eras. They may not understand even who designed these things, but that there is a relationship spatially, you know, that there is this kind of threshold being created in these three different locations, I think is pretty clear. But, you know, I don't know, I think we, in this field, we have to make a clearer division or resist the temptation to advocate for why architecture is important and just let the public decide why it's important. Let them, let them make the associations in their minds. Um, yeah, actually, I'm inclined to agree again from a, a communications point of view that it, the less is more, and I would always be an advocate of that, and that you, you're too inclined to lead the conversation if you rationalise how it looks or if you actually give an initial critique or insight. And I certainly, coming from perspective of, of art, and a, a huge amount of my work will be working with artists, is allow the public, allow the viewer to, to see what they want to see first. And it's, it's, again, it's the same thing here. Allow them to interpret, allow them to access it. And then at that point, they can enter into a deeper concept. And I'd use the concept certainly in, in a lot of our book, book designs. And then we make some very, very complex books of having multiple narratives. And the idea that 
if somebody wants to pick it up and skim at a very superficial level, they understand. It is, it is open to them as, as a very, as a reader who is, is an interest in the depth or what, what may lie behind the, the writer, or, writer or the artist or the architect's uh, intentions. But then they can move down through it and you can go through this tiered approach through the content and through the meaning a, as you wish. Um, but that very, very top level shouldn't actually carry any of that, as you say, complexity or that, uh, that um, I suppose, intellectual insight that, that the artist may want to confer on it or the curator may wish to confer on it. It's for the reader to interpret. You know, so. I, might, I just want to check one thing technically, if David's one is going to work or not. I'm not does, it, does it work? And then uh, when that's finished, I'd like to uh, maybe open uh, for questions. And the format that we'll use is that I'll take a number of questions together and then we'll ask the, the panel to respond to your questions. Okay. Does it, does it work? Maybe it doesn't. Okay. Maybe we'll... Uh, is nobody there? Okay. We might just, as that's been handled by somebody else, we might... Uh, uh, I'll just check and then we can have um, some questions. Maybe I'll start picking up the questions while, uh, while that's been uh, put together. Are there, um, are there people in the audience who would like to ask... Uh, the panel some questions okay. and what I'll do is I'll take uh, three questions together okay. Hello. Uh, it's just a quick comment rather than a question, and it relates to uh, Kieran Long's uh, recent remarks. We all know that uh, buildings are not dis uh, disinterested structures as such, that they're encoded with meanings and feelings, and very often uh, invested, uh, vested interests. And uh, I think artists are very good at decoding uh, that investment, and I think the examples that you showed reflect a kind of fine art approach, particularly with interactive uh, installation, where words are not important as such, but the engagement and the time element and time invested in looking at the work of art. So I think artists have been particularly purposeful in re-entering the scene. Uh, Pia mentioned the architect uh, uh, leaves the scene, where very often the artists move into the scene and, uh, and communicate very widely with the public at different levels. And that was very evident in the 2015 Fine Art Biennale, where there was a lot of architectonic uh, interventions and deconstructions. Thank you. Maybe what we might, okay. Oh, sorry, there's one, sorry. Um, I wondered if you could comment on, it made me think of the Aurelio Galfetti um, bit of the Biennale, and he said he has a, um, he doesn't have a good relationship with written history, and says his house uh, was born from 50 years of travel around the region, so much less about the words and the text. we might do is freeze them a little bit. Yes, one here. Okay. Uh, it's a reflection on the fact that we're in Venice, which is a city originally of many guilds with secrets of design, which held abstraction within them, and then they served the public by uh, having gained the study uh, so that the public who were in buildings that possibly was part of their life, like going to a church or whatever, 
they received um, a fully designed uh, thing. The paintings, the best of the paintings, are extremely abstract within their figuration. And um, because the word abstraction was mentioned, uh, my feeling is that actually abstraction is something common to absolutely everybody. And, you know, light has been mentioned, there are numbers of, of experiences that are in this Biennale, uh, in, including uh, a, a well uh, from the previous one has got water in it. So these are common experiences which are actually in some ways real but quite abstract. And um, I, I think that more value should be given to the fact that abstraction is, is, a, is, a common, is a common language and that actually is a helpful thing as opposed to concentrating on the figurative and external form of things. And I mean I'm saying this in relation to free space because I think that's the free space that is actually running through the discipline of life really. But we thank you for the questions uh, and comments. I think if we could hold that uh, question on history and uh, Galfetti to, uh, until after David has made his uh, presentation, I think that would just be a, a good structure, if you didn't mind. Okay, if you can put this on. Um, I've spoken of many of the ideas already. Um, what I'm just going to do is take you through uh, very much the thinking behind free space and not to present the, um, the final outcomes or the work, but actually the, the process. And I suppose the entangling of, of, of the free space manifesto and, and the ABCs that allowed us as communication designers to communicate with architects. And very, very quickly and, and very early on, we had to accept that free space is from Dublin, um, is of Grafton Architects. Um, it's of Venice. It, it belongs to Venice in respect of the Biennale and, and the support. But because of the global nature of the manifesto, it was for the world. And these are very simple ideas that we stuck to as we move through. So a universal concept that arguably should be comprehensible and accessible to all and visitors, experts alike. And we've discussed this. And the way to do that was obviously through language. Um, we certainly didn't use Google Translate because we couldn't actually get the nuances, but translation and interpretation was very, very important to us. But more so the translation and interpretation between architects, how they speak, and the graphic chatter that the graphic designers speak. And unfortunately, we didn't have any software engine to allow us to get to that. Um, but this was the, the key issue that we faced as, as designers, having a, a shared vocabulary, yet not actually having the same meaning and understanding of nuance when we began to use terms like form, rhythm, light and shade, material, time and scale. And we wish to integrate these um, throughout all of the communication design and the graphic identity, but we had to find a way that it would translate back to, to the architects. So very, very quickly, and this is just about the vernacular and the graphic vocabulary that we drew upon, free space is a manifesto, and typographically the vernacular is drawn of the manifesto. It is from the street. It has a sense of urgency, and we lean very heavily on what type and the printing from the Futurist Manifesto. And I don't need to go into the politics or, or, or the details of the manifesto, but it was t talking about the urgency of fly posting and the typographic vocabulary that, vocabulary that you would use. It's unrefined, you know. You know, you could say the free space as a graphic identity is ugly. Um, it doesn't have the actual very refined typographic approaches that we would typically do if it was a, a fine art piece or if it was very exclusive. But a manifesto is for all, and it needs to have that sense of accessibility and, and less refinement that you would look at. And then you take the actual overarching concept of light and shade, and you think about what that yields to a communication designer. So we started to look at the actual fabric of the city, the history of the architecture, and the columns that exist, obviously, in the uh, arsenale, and looking at the rhythm, the texture, and the contrast that exist there. And this begins to translate into a very early stage into a basic graphic vocabulary that allows us to interpret from typographic or graphic systems. And so the staining on the columns, the, the surface texture, these actually slowly move through and then begin to allow us to create this vertical or typographic vertical stack that we began to use. And they, they become, they become the, the basis for the typographic stacks that appear on 
on each of the um, the posters and in other communications. This is a video, but it, it's not working because of technical issues. And then you look at the buildings and the, the, the environmental staining that you see as you move around Venice and the bleaching of the sun and the contrast between the black and the whites. And this is it here. This is a, a, an absolute facsimile of what we see here. And, and this it, it is, it is a, a translation of the fabric of the buildings within the city brought to the Biennale. And then this man, our hero, um, this is uh, Claudio uh, Monteverdi, and we reference Venetian opera to find the organizing principles. How were we going to order, order all of the graphic elements? And uh, Monteverdi is widely regarded as the first Italian modernist, that opera before him was exclusive and elitist. Yet when he changed it, he made it a three-act structure, it became polyphonic, polyphonos, Greek for many voices. He began to make it accessible. He made it again, it, it, it resonates with the concept of the Free Space Manifesto. And we began to look at the cor correlation between the structure in the opera and then numbers within that. And these are studies that we began to look at based on the concept of light and shade the rhythm and the pace to create what we classified as a free space scale that actually allowed us to look at the broad range of applications and come up with a coherent underlying, sometimes invisible structure that allowed us to order the diverse information that was presented. And we came up with this concept of everything working within three acts. And this became 369, it's the actual sequence, the underlying grid and structure for all of the pages, all of the posters and so forth. This is a video, but I don't believe it's working, so we move on. So we produced over a thousand pages based on this, and it worked in wayfinding. But I wanted to just finish on this point. Um, there are very few, I suppose, communication designers absolutely concerned with how architects communicate or how we communicate architecture. Um, yet I found this uh, reference from a German designer called Kai Birick, and it's in a book by an architect turned designer called Andres Ubele. And he speaks of um, architecture as just one means of communication. It tells stories, shapes consciousness and memory, and can sometimes impart sensory and emotional well-being, but just shouldn't be all it does. And we've spoken of this here today. A building, when it is a good one, can have a message, and yet, at the same time, the architecture is just a framework for other media. Graphic displays, texts, wayfinding aids, and inscriptions. It doesn't have to be three-dimensional. This three-dimensional space constructed by the architect, the structural outcome that formulates a concept. The non-material signs, and I've said here, the graphic interventions, can play an equal part in supporting an implicit idea or indeed conveying it themselves. I think what Birik is saying here is that when the architect and the communication designer find a common ground, the actual overarching concept, the meaning, can be enriched. And I think that is our contribution to free space, and that was our intention when we sat with Yvonne and Shelley and the team, that actually our contribu contribution would, I suppose, yield a greater understanding and a richer manifestation of their manifesto. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Janie. Janie. Um, <laughs> that last piece, I don't know whether I agree with you or disagree with you. Um, uh, I think that uh, what is interesting in the kind of turnabout of, of this afternoon and the kind of technical um, uh, switch that um, am I understanding you to say uh, that 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 buildings are only a small percentage or a percentage uh, no we misinterpret each other already no I think obviously in architecture building is the priority but when we're speaking of communicating that actually what I use the term there graphic interventions or or, or dare I say it decorative intervention, something else that actually can make it more accessible, make it a, a richer experience um, to, to its users, to its owners, to people. Actually, that's a, that's a good thing, that actually it shouldn't be the building exclusively or architecture exclusively that, um, I suppose, engages with, with, with the user or with the public, that actually a collaborative um, engagement around what the the opportunity that exists within the building, you know, that I think it, it, it results in more interesting experiences, more interesting engagement. So I think that opportunity exists. 
but very few, and again, it comes back to, and this, I'm looking at this from an outsider's perspective, you know, that most buildings are, are presented fully formed with very few, apart from, I suppose, kind of regulatory interventions, graphic interventions, very few additional considerations how communication or decoration or other, or, or other interventions can enhance, enhance the space, you know. We do it in private residences, but generally you see it less in, I suppose, public public buildings. So, um, so an opportunity exists to to, to collaborate and share. Um, and while we're not thinking of a building in free space, I think certainly from the exhibition and the sense of the exhibition experience, I think we we did very well to collaborate and, and yield uh, a richer experience per se. Just when you're speaking, I'm reminded of the the beautiful. Uh, intervention on uh, a building that we built in in Milan for Bocconi University and the Italian graphic uh, uh, if you like uh, element of the building is very beautiful what they they did was they took the undercroft uh, the, uh, the the soffit of the of the buildings to to receive the information and it was a very bold move and I think that we're in a country where where design is of a very high level and uh, just when you're speaking there, I think that the, the graphic uh, application to Bocconi University enriched the building. But I think maybe the process of uh, all the architects in the room probably find that uh, wayfinding or the kind of graphics is a tiny percentage in the, um, in, the, in the budget for making buildings. And it's very late in the day when, when a, a graphic person if comes on board. And sometimes it can just be very superficial and applique. What you're kind of saying is that maybe there's a moment a bit earlier on that it could be more integrated. Maybe you want to make a comment, Pia, on that? Okay. Yeah, I have been working with, with artists in, in architectural projects. And for me, it's very important that I take them in the very early stages to, to work with me. And it's, it has been uh, with the light designers, I mean light, about light architecture design, art design, and it, they are really good examples of, you have to take them early enough to the process. I mean, yeah, like graphic designers too, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just aware now that we're coming up to uh, four, four o'clock um, and uh, I, maybe I would like, uh, just in terms of the person who referred to um, uh, um, Galfetti, uh, in terms of history, um, that um, maybe we can have a private discussion on, of that in, in a while. Um, an amazing architect who uh, probably is steeped in uh, his DNA in history and maybe steps into the future uh, by virtue of the way he makes his work. Um, maybe just as a last comment, because it's four o'clock, Maybe I'd ask each uh, person just to have a, a, a short sentence maybe to describe um, um, an aspect of communicating uh, architecture for the audience. I mean, it's, it's been an interesting discussion. I think um, the thing I think is that exhibitions are the most interesting medium we have to communicate architecture. They're better than magazines, they're better than the internet. And the Biennale does an extraordinary job I, I love that the Biennale has become so important and your project just increases that feeling because we all come here and discuss the discipline with evidence around us, with things we can talk about, with your building somehow next to us. We wouldn't meet like this in Helsinki. So I just think the medium of exhibitions is something we should celebrate in architecture right now. It's so vibrant, it's so exciting. Museums are getting more interesting. Um, and the more that we all pour into those institutions, the better they will get. So I'm, I'm really hopeful about this medium and I think your show just adds to my excitement. Yeah, at my home I have had maybe a thousand visitors in my living room during the last uh, 10 years. But I, um, and I have been uh, talking with people about, about the space and, and my house and the case study. Uh, but here <laughs> maybe we can reach half a million people and I have reconstructed my home there. It's my own corner, which is one to one there. <clears throat> So I'm, I have been really happy to see so many people and students um, interested in, in, in that corner too and other things here. It has been an amazing occasion for making better society, yeah. 
I, I'll just pick up on obviously what you just said there. You know, the difference between a thousand visitors to your home and five hundred thousand people here is is immense, and I think um, it's because of the obviously the scale and the accessibility of here. And for me. We've worked with some of the most amazing content as, as designers that we've ever been presented with in producing the books in, uh, for free space. Um, but I just feel, think of the audience, think of so many more people that can engage with, um, with concepts around architecture, with the impact of architecture, the value of architecture, um, if you speak beyond your peers. And I think that's, that's important. And I think critics and uh, is very, very important as well. But I think the discourse should be beyond architecture for it to really exert its, its influence. I'd just like to, to first of all, thank uh, our three guests for uh, making time in their busy lives to sit here this afternoon to have a conversation. I'd like to thank the audience for staying, and I'm sorry for the technical hitch in the beginning, but maybe you had conversations of architecture between yourselves that you mightn't have had if you were walking around um, uh, separately. But I'd just like to say that um, uh, hearing uh, people speak and uh, being involved, our, our team, and I'd just like to say our team have been extraordinary, um, and the Biennale team has been extraordinary. And what is amazing is to watch uh, people's reactions to various pieces. And some people react to certain pieces more than others. I think for all of us here as architects that maybe as we go around, we secretly write which ones touch us emotionally and connect with us emotionally and that maybe there is another way and we can edit out some are more successful than others. Why is that? And that we, you have a, a platform here of hundreds of hundreds of hardworking architects around the world trying to communicate and really we should try and in our own minds uh, audit that and some being more successful than others, why is that case? But as an ensemble, I am, and our team, I think is true to say, are enriched by the collaboration of all these people here and the other participants. And as we said, the buildings are participants and they can't talk back, but the participants can. It's been a wonderful experience for us, I think it's true to say, this kind of engagement, challenging and uh, informative. So I'd like to thank our guests and I'd like to thank you as an audience for staying here this afternoon. I hope you really enjoy the rest of your time in the Biennale. Thank you. Thank you.